All right, so this week our world is going to change very dramatically, okay? Over the last, what, four weeks really, we spent a majority of our time talking about a traditional, I'm going to put traditional in finger quotes, traditional 3D modeling pipeline. Well, today we're going to take one step further into the world of photorealism and talk about subdivision surfaces. You know, eight or nine years ago when I first started teaching, I used to, I used to say, subdivision surfaces are the future, right? They're not the future anymore, they're what we do, okay? They're actually part of our everyday modern workflow and it's something that we need to incorporate immediately into our daily production practice when creating 3D models, okay? Let me just uh, look at, show you real fast on Canvas what we're striving to accomplish this week. Two big missions, first and foremost, and we're gonna do this together in class today. We have a fun little lab assignment in week six called the medicine bottle. Dun, da, da, da. So we'll come back and talk about this one in probably about mm, 30 minutes or so. But you're going to be making a medicine bottle, and most importantly, you're going to be making a medicine bottle using exclusively subdivision surfaces. Okay, So we're going to create a new surface type this week. Actually, we're not going to create it. We're going to transform our old models into this new surface type. And I'll show you the benefits and the challenges of working with sub-Ds here in a minute. So we'll come back to our medicine bottle here in a couple minutes. Our homework this week is going to be the train on steroids, but it's going to incorporate subdivision surfaces, and you're going to be making a cannon. Okay? Um, the cannon here, and the image of the cannon, is a really great example of why we want to use subdivision surfaces as much as we can. Let me zoom in, we can take a look-see here. Okay? If you look at the picture of our little cannon, what don't you see on the barrel of the cannon? Clearly, the barrel is just a cylinder, but what don't you see? Polygons, or some sort of illusion of polygons. The faceted edges of a cylinder are, a, are an immediate tell that this is computer generated, right? Our world doesn't have faceted edges on round, curvy shapes, right? Just look at our faces. Do you see a hard edge anywhere? Nope. In computer graphics, the easiest way to break the illusion that we're trying to create is to show our audience a faceted edge. I mean, it's, it's something we can spot a mile away, and we're like, that's not real, because clearly I can see the man behind the curtain, the great and powerful Oz, okay? It's all an illusion, this thing. But we have some technology that will allow us to create a really refined, refined illusion. This technology is called subdivision surfaces, and it's actually been around for, the, for a long, long time. Uh, we've refined it and gotten really good at it in like the last 10 years. And now it's become uh, the go-to surface type for the high-end visual effects and animation world. One that we're going to want to incorporate going forward. Now, uh, with great power comes great responsibility, okay? Uh, you know, in order to get these really high quality results, we need to change our thinking a little bit. And our modeling approach is going to be adjusted ever so slightly to control the algorithm. Because subdivision surfaces applies a new kind of smoothing algorithm that puts the entire mesh under tension. We want to be able to control the influence of that, of, of that algorithm across the surface of our geometry. Um, so we're going to be looking at how you know, we can kind of play inside this new sandbox. Okay? So they're, they're going to give us something pretty spectacular. But it also requires a little bit more skill in controlling this new technology. Okay? Let's jump back over into Maya and take a look at how we can work with subdivision surfaces. Okay? All right, so back inside of Maya here, I'm going to close the door, crack it. I think our construction workers have gone. Yeah, I think they took off. They took off. Yeah, it's okay. I think they destroyed my office a little bit, but that's okay. Oops, that's not going to work. All right, now we can see the screen a little bit. All right, so I'm going to start with a simple cylinder. In all honesty, I'm going to start with two simple cylinders. Let's just create one real fast. There's our little cylinder guy. And I'm, before I get too much further into it, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into the input node on the cylinder, and I'm going to reduce the subdivision axis so I have eight sides going around this cylinder. So I got my channel box opened up. Here's the input nodes for my cylinder. Let's change this down to eight. Okay. 
And of course, what we see here is a heavily faceted object. You know, now we're working in computer graphics of like, you know, 1995. FYI, very recently, um, I don't know if it was posted very recently, but I saw it a couple days ago, um, Westwood Studios. Does anyone know Westwood Studios? The probably biggest commercial success in franchise is the Command and Conquer series, okay, uh -huh. on the video game side. Great series. They posted a really fantastic series of videos on YouTube that just talk about their kind of history and the challenges that they overcome bringing their titles to the marketplace. So I really recommend it because this, this uh, shapes like this, this is one of the things that they were talking about in the videos, how, how little geometry they had to make their wonderful shapes okay, uh, in their games. So now we're back in like mid-90s technology, just a very, very simple little cylinder. Okay? Now for my illustration purposes, I think what I'm going to do is that I'm going to delete the caps okay, on this guy. So let me just zip over. Whoops. Yeah, using the Moto keyboard shortcuts isn't going to do anything. There we go. Control backspace. And now I have now I have that. Okay. So next step, I'm going to delete the history on this bad boy, and I'm going to duplicate it. I want to just pull this duplicate cross on the x-axis. So now I have simply two of them. And I'm just going to check my object history on both of these guys. Yep, life is good, very pleased here, and we can start to get to work. So clearly the, uh, these objects incredibly faceted, very, very easy to see the illusion of computer graphics in front of us. Now we, w we like low resolution graphics. They're very easy to control. The box modeling technique, as we've been exploring for the past couple of weeks, is something that's simple that we can kind of you know, grab onto very, very quickly, right? Low resolution geometry is just simpler, okay? Every semester I, I joke around and say I'm going to make a sign, and maybe now that we have our wonderful makerspace, uh, perhaps I will. My sign's going to say mo, mo polys, mo problems, right? The, the more polygons we have inside of our scenes, the more problems we have, okay? So we like this low resolution geometry, it's just easier, right? However, to get the results that we're truly looking for, especially as we go into this real-time rendering world, and when we start making images for the television market, for the feature film market, we can't have resolution like this we need to have something that's of much higher quality. So thus enter the role of subdivision surfaces. Now subdivision surfaces takes our traditional 3D model as we have here and it transforms it. Honestly what it does is that we're applying an algorithm, a little bit of computer science onto the mesh that in my imagination creates a little miniature black hole in the middle of our mesh. You guys know anything about black holes? I think they're awesome. I think they're really kind of cool, right? So it's, a, it's a great bit of uh, physics that almost seems like science fiction, right? A gigantic uh, vacuum cleaner in space that's sucking everything to it. Did you guys ever see the, see the film uh, Interstellar? Yeah, great film. All about black holes and relativity. It's just wonderfully, wonderfully done by Chris Nolan and his crew. Um, so I like to imagine that when I hit the, uh, uh, when I tr apply this sub D algorithm to our, our objects here, a miniature black hole is created at the interior of my mesh and all of the polygons are being bent and transformed and, and kind of deformed to the location of the black hole. It's almost as if the entire mesh has been put under tension and the, everything is being wrapped and warped around that black hole. Let's do it real fast. I have my cylinder on the right selected and the magical keyboard shortcut is the three key. The three key on the top row of your, uh, of your keyboard, not the number pad on the right, but the top row. The three key is going to allow us to see very instantly here the number of, or the, the influence of our sub D algorithm. Okay, and there it is. So what does it look like? Just right off the surface. Yeah, now it looks like a two. Now it looks perfectly cylindrical. We don't see those faceted edges of our simple eight-sided cylinder. Now we're seeing something that appears to be almost infinitely, uh, you know, more you know, higher resolution. Okay. This is the benefit of working with sub-Ds or subdivision surfaces: is that we can create the illusion of a higher resolution object from an eight-sided cylinder or a lower resolution object.
Now perhaps uh, I want to remove the algorithm and this is, this is uh, in itself probably one of the more powerful features of this entire workflow is that we're not converting it, we're not transferring our object in from one type into another, we're applying an algorithm, a little bit of math and we can turn this algorithm on and off. Has anyone stumbled upon the number that allows us to go back to our original cage? One. Okay. So one gets us back to our original shape and three applies the algorithm. One. Now two is weird, right? Two is literally in between one and three. It sounded funnier in my mind. Yeah. Uh, but two, what we're honestly seeing here in two is the subdivision cage. Okay? The computer and this algorithm is referencing the original shape and it's bending and warping that shape based off of the, uh, the, the overall volume and the distribution of these polygons in the cage itself. Here's my suggestion to you, don't worry about number two. It's only going to confuse you. Um, I almost never have the visibility of my polygonal cages on and the algorithm on at the exact same time. For me personally, it just turns into a visual noise and I just want to see the final finished result. Okay. Which is pretty great. Pretty great. All right. So, these are this is the simple explanation as to what what subdivision surfaces allows us to do. Let's start taking this one step further and look at a little bit more complex application of the algorithm. Because on simple little tubes, it's no problem. Let me just get rid of those objects. I want to put a new cylinder back into play here. And like I did with its friend earlier, I'm going to change the subdivision axis to 8 to make it just super, super low res. All right. Do what again? Yeah. There it is. Yep. All right. So I'm going to hit the three key on the top row of my keyboard. And it looks a little bit different. Okay. This algorithm is being applied to everything on the object itself. Right. So with those caps on the tops and the bottoms of my cylinder, you can see that the result that we're getting here is radically different. Right. That black hole in the center of the mesh is physically deforming and bending all the polygons as it kind of metaphorically places tension across the entire mesh. It's pulling the polygons into the center in my imagination. Okay? So our shape up here at the top radically changes. Okay? What was a, a flat cap at the beginning has now been pulled into these wonderful radiuses. Okay? And this is where the challenge of working with sub D's come in. Because we want to be able to apply the algorithm in certain areas and kind of turn it off, if you will, in other areas. And perhaps I just misspoke. You can never actually turn the algorithm off on certain areas of the mesh. You're just reducing its influence, right? So instead of influencing these polygons at a rate of 100%, maybe you're only doing, you know, one tenth of 1%. It's still influencing those polygons, but at a rate that's imperceptible, right? So let's look at how we can start to control this a little bit. Because ideally what I want to create here is a cylinder that's got a top and a bottom that's perfectly cylindrical. I don't want to see the faceted edges of, of, our, of our original shape. I kind of want to do a hybrid of both, right? I want the, the tops and the bottoms to be perfectly flat, but all the polygons that go around the outside of the cylinder to be perfectly cylindrical. Okay? So here's how we do it. I'm going to go back. Hit the one key, go back to my original mesh. And now we need to start applying some very basic, or excuse me, not applying, inserting some very simple geometry to influence the, uh, the, the, uh, the algorithm on my mesh. Okay? Additional edges are what we need to create. Now, before we start adding these edges, I want you to look very carefully at how this model has been constructed. We basically have a massive plane change at the top and at the bottom of our cylinder. We have a plane kind of horizontally, if you will, that creates the cap of our cylinder. And then we have another plane that goes vertically up and down. Okay? I want to influence the algorithm at that plane change. So wherever we're trying to monkey with and mess with the algorithm, we need to add edges in that area. Okay? So I want to mess with the algorithm up here at the top. 
So by inserting some additional edges, we do that. All right, so those edges up here, this is the original series of edges that create the plane change, all this jazz, OK? I always like to focus in on the original edge that creates the plane change. And then we're going to create an edge sandwich with the original edge being in the middle. Okay? The original edge is the meat of this entire edge sandwich. And I need to create a new edge that's above and then another edge loop that's below. Okay? So we're physically going to cut in some new edge loops into our, into our mesh here. Grand total of three. The original's in the middle, then one above and one below. Let's do it real fast. What tools, go back to last week if you will, what tools can we use to cut in some edge loops into our mesh? Multi-cut's a great one. We love multi-cut. Multi-cut's so great, right? Um, let's do multi-cut. OK, I got multi-cut. Now, what, uh, what keyboard shortcut do I need to hold down in order to cut an edge loop? Control. Control. You got it. Because we need to have our new edge loops go all the way around. So I want to hold it down here below. Yoink, there's one. So I have the original edge here. I've added an another edge loop below. And then, you know, the caps, you know, if I hold down the control key on the cap, it's not going to allow me to do it, which is kind of a bummer, right? Let's go back to the selection tool. Here's a great little trick. The multi-cut tool is not going to give me a radial uh, edge loop up here at the top. Of my, uh, of my cylinder. So how I combat this, believe it or not, is the extrude tool. I'm going to select all those polygons and run the extrude tool. But, and uh, a little bit of offset goes a long way. Something like that. Q to drop the tool. I'll drop the selection. What keyboard shortcut allows me to, uh, to apply the algorithm? Three. So with those two new edge loops cut into my mesh, the three key will show me the impact of those new edges. Now we're kind of shoring up that transition between the top of our cylinder and that vertical plane going around the outside of it. Okay? If we compare the tops to the bottoms, so here it is with all that information, uh, all those new edges kind of plugged in. And then down at the bottom, it's all rounded out. Let's do it again. Let's do it one more time. I want to start influencing how the algorithm is, uh, um, is, is or I'm um, sorry, I want to modulate how the algorithm is influencing our mesh. And we do that by inserting new edge loops into the entire scene. Okay? Let's do it one more time. I want to use, of course, uh, let's hit the one key to go back to the unsubdivided state. state. The multi-cut tool is great. We like multi-cut. This is great. I really encourage you to use it. There's one other tool that I like to use, especially in uh, in this world it is the insert edge loop tool. Okay? And you can find the insert edge loop tool under the mesh tool section at the top of your screen. Okay? The insert edge loop tool does something very, very similar to multi-cut. It's just going to insert in some edges, but sometimes, yep, not on that one, there it is. Sometimes it gives you just a little bit more control. So it's six to one, Half a dozen to another. Yeah, not going to work down there like it did on its, uh, on its friend. So we'll just select the polygons down here at the bottom and run extrude. It's a little bit. Now, as I start to extrude these polygons and slice it in, I'm paying very close attention to the uniformity of the new polygons that I'm creating. If you look at the size of the polygon here, it's very close in proportion to the polygon immediately above it, right? They're kind of similar. If both of those new poly strips, those poly loops, are the same size, we're going to get a very consistent result. Okay. Hit the Q key to drop the tool. I'll zoom out. And once again, I'll hit the 3 key to get going. And there it is. Voila! Pretty awesome. That's a great looking cylinder, right? It's almost identical in shape, size, and proportion to its original uh, unsum divided friend. But now we don't see any of those lovely, you know, those horrible hard edges and those faceted uh, surfaces that we had before. Okay. Some of you are probably sitting here thinking, Pat, 
why in the world am I going to go through this process? Okay, Because that shape there doesn't look too dissimilar to something that looks like this. Why wouldn't I just bevel it? And just have a whole bunch of segments in there. Because big picture, yeah, those look very similar. The one that I just created took like two seconds to make. But here's the answer to that question. There's actually two answers to the question. First and foremost, uh, over here we have 340 faces, 340 polygons versus 56 polygons, or roughly a sixth the size. That's an incredible reduction in, in polygonal weight. Um, in addition, and this is kind of the, the area that I get into, what if I wanted to change the radius? What if I want to go in and change the size of the curvature at the tops and the bottom of my cylinder, uh, or of either of these cylinders? At times, the object history will allow me to do that. But what if you don't have object history, right? What if you physically don't have the ability to go in uh, to that object and change any of the input nodes? Or maybe change the input node screws up something later, so that's just not an option for us, right? Subdivision surfaces, if you look, or excuse me, meshes that, that have edge loops for, uh, for the surface. Look at how their surfaces are created. I'm going to get these two things very close so it's really easy to see. Okay. Very, very similar, right? Whenever we do an edge bevel, this is what's called a destructive edit. We are physically changing our mesh, and we're changing the curvature of the mesh in the areas that we've beveled. It's a point of no return. Right? I can't unbevel the edge. Right? I can't go in and just like start deleting a lot of these edge loops in here and then just kind of hope that I'm going to get the original shape. You're going to fail every single time. Right? Once you bevel something, you've destroyed the mesh. It's a point of no return. It's always going to have a radius on it going forward. The only way to remove the edge or to remove the bevel, nine times out of ten, is just to rebuild it. Right? which is not exactly an attractive option, especially when you're working inside of, of, of a team environment. Your modeling supervisor could come in and say, Pat, I love what you're doing here, but I really need the radiuses on those edges a lot bigger. They're way too small. I can't see them on camera, or maybe they're causing a problem with X, Y, and Z, or maybe just aesthetically it's just not what he or she is into, and they want it to change, right? And as a good production artist, I go, yes, sir, I'm in, okay? If I had used edge beveling in this sequence, I am screwed, right? Because now a simple change in the size of the radius forces me to rebuild and reconstitute that entire part of the, of the model. Thumbs down. That's a big thumbs down. That could be hours of work, depending on the complexity of the model that I'm working with, right? However, in the subdivision surface way, all we've done to create the radius around the boundary of our cylinder here is add edges onto the interior field of the geometry. I haven't changed the mesh, right? I didn't actually change the boundary shape of this object, right? I cut new edges underneath on the exact same plane as the polygon that was there, right? Larger point being, sub-D meshes using this technique are editable. I can go in and very easily strip out those edges without having to wonder and, and worry that I'm damaging my model, right? It's almost kind of like a non-destructive way of adding radiuses into our, into, our, into our models, okay? So I can very quickly just go in, grab that edge loop, that edge loop, command backspace, boof, okay? And now I can have a conversation with my, with my supervisor and say, how big do you want that radius to be? Let's prototype it. Sometimes if it's just changing the, the radius, we don't actually need to go in and delete the, uh, the geometry. We just simply need to move it around. Check this out. This is actually kind of fun. The, the size of the radius on sub-D models comes, is determined directly by the, the distribution of these edges around, around the boundary, around the plane change. So if I was to grab that one, I'm going to scale it in. Something like that. And then I'll take this bottom one here, I'm going to move it down. 
Okay. Yeah, let's press, let's press 3. See how the radius is much larger now? The distribution of these edges, their proximity to each other, determines the size of the radius that they're going to create. Okay. If we compare the top and the bottom of this guy, really big kind of fluffy marshmallow on the top, and down here at the bottom, incredibly tight. And the change of the radius, or the size of the radius, is linked directly to the proximity of those edges to each other. So the closer the edges are, the tighter the transition. The further, the further they are apart from each other, the bigger the transition with sub-D meshes. Okay? All right. So far, so good. You with me? Everyone kind of understanding it to a certain degree? Yeah? Okay. Let's take this into action a little bit here. Last week, in this, uh, last week you guys were charged with making a train. How'd that go? Okay, good. That's the correct response. Mm, is okay. Uh, if you re rewind to week one in here, I told you I was going to push you guys, right? We're never going to stop. Well, we're always, you know, the way to learn how to be a 3D modeler is to do as much failing as possible, right? Uh, this is so, so nerdy and so like kindergarten kind of education. But what, is, what does fail mean? First attempt in learning, right? Right. I have a first grader, so this is kind of my world, right? I'm a big, I'm a big believer that, that everything you need to know in life you learn in kindergarten. Okay, I'm a big believer in that. Okay, so it's important, honestly, it's important as 3D modelers for us to be pushed, okay, to understand that this is a process and that our experience is going to determine the outcome. The computer is not going to do anything for us, right? Not a single thing. We have to do it all. Um, so these experiences help develop that, that mindset and that thinking, that almost kind of like chess player mentality of how we're going to walk through the construction of these models, okay? So it's an important skill. One that we're going to be you know, working every single week. All right. Um, so if you feel like your train looks nothing like a train, good. I'm happy about that, right? Because in those moments, you've learned more about 3D modeling than you will ever learn from listening to me talk for two hours. Okay? And that's ultimately the goal in all this. So let's put this into practice a little bit here. Okay? Last week, we spent some time uh, on our train. And maybe what I'll do just for, just for giggles here. What am I doing? Uh, the right view, excuse me. Let's see, do I still have it? Did I keep the reference from last week? No, it does not appear that I did. That's okay. Uh, let me just uh, make a cylinder, okay? So much of our model last week was a cylinder. Let's say probably half of what we created last week were a whole series of cylinders, right? We spent a lot of time working on that smokestack at the top of our train last week, and the 3D modeling nerd, okay, I can't not do it. I gotta, you know, if I'm gonna model something, I'm gonna model it, right? Let's go back uh, to the train reference. I'm not gonna put all the reference in that we talked about last week. Um, let's just download it real fast. I gotta do it. I can't not do it. I hate being me sometimes. All right. All right. Let's jump back over to Maya, and I'm going to put this image plane into the system again. Okay. Someone asked last week how I flipped this around so it's pointing the right direction. What was the solution to that problem? Because right now, the picture is facing the wrong direction instead of our 3D scene. The front of the train in the picture is facing the wrong way. How do I know that, by the way? Say again? You got it. Our compass down here tells us where the front of the scene is. The front of the train in the picture is facing screen right, but the front of the scene in the actual 3D scene is screen left. So I need to flip this image around 180 degrees, okay? Simply changing the scale to negative 1. 
We'll do it. It's an easy, easy way. All right, I'm happy with that. Rock and roll. So now I can put this in. I want to put this on a display layer too. We talked about this last week as well. It's a great way to put things into your scene without uh, and, and with the ability to organize. And I like it because I get to turn things off. Okay. When it's on R down here, this stands for reference. So now I can see it, but I can't click on it. Okay. I can't. I can't click on it, which is really nice, especially for reference photographs. All right, so here we go. I want to make the smokestack again, just really fast. And I think we'll start to see the benefit of these sub-D objects very, very quickly. Because now we can create something that doesn't have a whole lot of information on it. Something that is relatively low res. I want to change the alpha gain on my backdrop to 0.25. Turn the grid on. That way I can just start to see how all this is going to work together. All right. Yeah. Excellent. It looks like I'm not quite there. Ta-da. There we go. I want to fan this out. Move it down so it's roughly kind of in the spot that I want. Back to work. Okay, so now I'm in full-blown extrude mode now as I start to make the, all these bands that go up and around, uh, up and around my mesh. So let's do this. Let's start extruding out these shapes. I want to do something slightly different here. I know that I want to have a whole series of extruded shapes to be very similar to another. I want the distance down here for those bands to be kind of consistent. So I have some, um, some, some creative liberties in here that I can play with. Okay? Certainly I could just go in here with the multi-cut tool and start slicing it in like that. That's a good way of working. Okay? Also holding down the control key and, and loop slicing in here. That's lovely as well. That will work. Okay? But here's the, the detail that I was looking at. I wanted to have the, uh, the thickness of these bands be the same. So by extruding them at the exact same time, I'm ensuring that they're going to be the same, the same thickness at the top and at the bottom. I don't have to remember, remember a number, no likey numbers. I'm an artist, not an engineer. Okay, The least math I can do, the better. It's a victory when I can like balance my checkbook every month. I'm like, yeah. You know, it's, I'm joking. I'm a, little bit, I'm a whole lot better with money than that. So. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Um, so these, this is a great little suggestion on 